I'll turn on the captions because sometimes I forget to do that. Um, and we have people slowly coming in. Welcome, very uh, welcome to this program. Um, if you want to drop in the chat um, where you're tuning in from, um, what brought you here today? Um, have you read David's books before? Um, or Safrania's books. Um, yeah, anything you want. Just just let us just let us know you exist out in the world um, by um, by uh, chatting by putting some messages in the chat. And I'll get started in a few seconds. Uh, it looks like we have about twenty people, so we're almost there. Um, you know what? I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, hi, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I thank you very much for joining this, uh, joining us for this virtual program for those we thought we knew. First, I want to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs, and we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. Um, if you are not a member, please consider supporting our museum by becoming a member. All members receive free or reduced admission to our author programs, um, receive uh, free admission to the house and museum, um, also year-round discounts in the store and cafe and much more. Um, please visit our website for more information or just reach out to me. Um, in the chat, and I can uh, get you that information. And now on to our guests. Our author, David Joy, is the author of When These Mountains Burn, which was a winner of the 2020 DeShiel Hammett Award, The Line That Held Us, winner of the 2018 uh, SIBA, or SIBA Book Prize, the Weight of This World, and Where All Light Tends to Go, which was an Edgar finalist for Best Novel, First Novel. Our moderator, Frania Scott, has published six books, and her essays, short stories, and articles have appeared in numerous publications. Currently, Safrania is the founding director of Alma College's MFA in Creative Writing, which is a low-residency graduate program based in Alma, Michigan. And we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat um, if you have a specific question, um, please just put that in the Q&A section that's at the bottom left of the screen. Um, and you can also click on captions to see live auto captioning for the program. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I will be putting a link in the chat to purchase those we thought we knew through our museum store. Your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. And that is all from me. I will turn this over to David and Safrania. Enjoy. Thank you, Omar. And thank you, David. I'm yeah. to be here speaking with you. Yeah, yeah, it's mutual. <laughs> so I noticed that Omar didn't uh, say what the book is about. So if, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to read the inside flap here so that yeah, yeah. The, the people who haven't read the book know what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so uh, David's new book, and it says, a searing novel about the cracks that form in a small North Carolina community and the evils that unfurl from its center. Toya Gardner, a young Black artist from Atlanta, has returned to her ancestral home in the North Carolina mountains to trace her family history and complete her graduate thesis. But when she encounters a still standing Confederate monument in the heart of town, she sets her sights on something bigger. Meanwhile, local deputies find a man sleeping in the back of a station wagon and believe him to be nothing more than some slack jawed drifter. Yet a search of the man's vehicle reveals that he is a high ranking member of the Klan and the uncovering of a notebook filled with local names threatens to turn the mountain on end. After two horrific crimes split the county apart, every soul must wrestle with deep and unspoken secrets that stretch back for generations. Richly drawn, embracingly honest, those we thought we knew reckons with an urgent, essential question. What do you do when everything you ever believe crumbles away? 
So, David, you are the author of four novels. Yeah. And your fans on this call will know that those those novels, including this one, are firmly seated in the land from which you grew up. Yeah. The mountains of North Carolina. And those previous four books are about the, the economic conditions, about drug addiction, about um, people uh, seeking opportunities where there are none, uh, the landscape changing, towns disappearing. So much ab about the, the, this whole location, but never before about race. Yeah. So I was, I have to say, David, I was really surprised when I started reading this book and realized that it was nothing like what you'd ever written before. And, yeah. and my first question has to be, what, why? Why yeah. this topic? And and what made you change from, from this focus to this one, from that focus to this one? Yeah, I, th I think that there, there are a lot of things um, that, that went into that. So one, uh, this novel um, is something that I have been working on for a very long time. The truth is that the, the earliest scenes of this novel that I wrote uh, were somewhere around 10 years ago. And uh, I've written all, I wrote all of those other novels over that same course of time. You know, uh, this, this was something that was kind of always working in the background. Um, oh. And I think it, I think it just took me a really, really long time uh, to figure out what I was wanting it to do and to figure out how to go about doing it uh, in a way that didn't feel, um, exploitative and in a way that, that felt like it was trying to do real work. Um, and, and so I would say that, and I would also say that I think that there was a major departure, uh, and a kind of shift in my work that took place after that third novel. Um, you know, and, and so even with when these mountains burn, I, I think that there was a shift that took place where, where the work started to take on more of a social context in ways that maybe those first three hadn't, um, you know, and, and so with that, with When These Mountains Burn, uh, that was a novel that was very much centered around the opioid epidemic. Uh, and it, it was, um, you know, it was because I, it became an inignorable presence of, of kind of my day to day life. Uh, and it just, it felt, the work felt essential. Uh, and in the same way, the work here felt essential, um, you know, and I think one of the major questions for me that I just kept wrestling with uh, was, can you write a book about race uh, that is primary and white supremacy that is primarily, if not solely intended for a white audience? Uh, and, you know, and that's not to say that that should a you know a black reader engage with the text that you don't hope the story and the characters ring true but that is to say that i think the majority of the questions uh and and the things that are being discussed within this uh book are things that have been lived discussed understood ad nauseum by that community in a way that uh you know white people continue to just not have the conversations mm -hmm. and why did you feel why did you feel you want to untangle that? Why? Because I, th I, th I think the work rests solely on the shoulders of white America. Um, you know, I think if we go back and, and um, you know, if you go back and listen to Toni Morrison, uh, you know, in that interview that, that with Charlie Rose, uh, there comes a moment where she says, you know, white people have a problem. And she said, you need to leave me out of it. Uh, and, and what she meant, I think, was clean up your own house. Uh, it was that the burden of the conversation and the burden of the work had continued to be placed squarely on the shoulders of the black community. And it was never their burden to begin with. Um, you know, and I, th I think that's something that we have just seen over and over. Uh, you know, I think about that. <clears throat> that interview with James Baldwin back in the sixties. And he's speaking with that uh, sociology professor 
And, and the guy asks him, he says, why does it always have to be about color? And, uh, you know, and James Baldwin eats him alive, you know, uh, but, but you jump forward, you know, uh, 65 years from then and people are still asking, why does it have to be about color? Uh, you know, they, we just keep refusing to have the conversation. And, and so for me, this book was a matter of trying to force white characters and by extension, white readers into the conversations that they were not having outside of moments of black death and black trauma. Oh. And David, what stuns me about the way that you do this is that you tease out that conversation that 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 doesn't um that that people that, that is within people and they don't realize it. So you know you mentioned the phrase white supremacy and we tend to to go to the clan images, right? And to a certain um, extreme level of white supremacy, which you have put in this book. But you also play that against a, a different type of, of way yeah, someone yeah. feel about race without even realizing that that person does not realize that, that they think of people of color as the other and they, they're living that way. And they don't realize it. Yeah. I mean, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to to even explain, let alone write full conversations that 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 show the complexity of that thinking. Right? Yeah. So yeah, I, th I think I was, you know, I was wanting to examine um white supremacy like an onion, kinda. And to me, uh, you know, those the the really overt things that we see it's not that they're it's not that they're not dangerous uh you, you know it's not that that super overt racism isn't a very dangerous thing but it is that it's that papery thin bullshit that's on the outside of an onion you know and i and i think the things that i find most dangerous are the super subtle ways in which white supremacy you know, uh, moves throughout every system of power that exists in this country. You know, uh, if, if you were to ask me if I'm, you know, if I find it more scary to think about like a Klan rally, or I find it more scary to think about something subtle like gerrymandering and voter suppression, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I believe that is the more dangerous, you know, thing i think it's easy you know you look at one thing and it's scary it's visually scary and it's intimidating and i think the things that are really the most dangerous in this country are things that are operating that are really you know uh subtle and 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 more of a covert way and that's that's really what i wanted the book to do was kind of work its way peeling back layers and layers and layers until we start to see that, you know, see that reality. Yeah. And, and that it's, that all may not be well, you know, just because it looks well on the surface, you know, how many times yeah. does the character in here in the, your book says, well, this, it was fine. Everything yeah. was always, we were fine. You know, we lived together in harmony. You know, that guy was my best friend. Everything was fine until that Toya Gardner showed up. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? And, and, but she got people questioning, you know, was it really fine? Or were people yeah. just not talking about things? Yeah, I, yeah, I, th I think that, you know, th the sad reality is that we continue to be a people. And when I say we, you know, I'm speaking strictly as, you know, as, as white America, uh, I think we continue to be a people who, um, who do not want to be made uncomfortable for very long, if at all. Uh, and so when we do engage in these conversations, it's only when uh, there is, there is no way to avoid it. Like, like, and those are moments of, you know, that are typically following black death or black trauma. So I think about a moment like 2020, uh, for instance, you know, and all of a sudden, 
Uh, we have Ahmad Arbery chased and gunned down in the street and killed like a dog. Uh, we jump forward a month and we watch Breonna Taylor be killed by police in Kentucky. Uh, we jump forward a couple more months and the whole world watches as Derek Chauvin kneels on the throat of George Floyd. Uh, and suddenly these things are happening in a way that like there's no chance uh, to avoid it anymore. And even in moments like that, I think that the majority of white America is looking for the next gap where things can get just quiet enough that we can usher the monster back into the closet. And then shh, thank God we don't have to talk about it anymore. Uh, you know, I think that as a country, uh, we're a people who have been living in a house that has been taken on water for 300 years. Uh, you know, the floor joists are rotten. Uh, the foundation is cracked. And rather than go downstairs and stand, you know, neck deep in the water, we're still sitting upstairs in the living room, uh, you know, watching reruns or Roseanne. Uh, you know, we're just, we're refusing to do the work. Uh, we're refusing to be made uncomfortable for long enough that any type of real uh, action might take place. And that, that speaks to the Langston Hughes quote that you have at the beginning of your book. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and I, at the core of... Um, you know, it's so deeply seated uh, with everything that this country uh, was and what it would become and what it is uh, and that you can't you can't really have any conversation about anything with regards to power in this country without recognizing uh, the way that white supremacy is filtering it, filtering in uh, and. You know, to kind of get back to that, you know, that refusal to be made uncomfortable, it's because we don't have to. Mm -hmm. It's because uh, not, it doesn't matter to me if anything changes, right? Like my, nothing about my life changes. I'm going to be fine. And I'm fine whether I ignore it uh, or I'm fine whether I face it head on. And so for the majority of white Americans, I think it's that uh, I think that refusal is because we just don't have to like there. There is no consequence to not doing the work. Um, Let me ask you about. So I, I sent you. A, a chapter from a book I did about the, the yeah. Thomas Merton. So this yeah, yeah. Everyday conversations with Thomas Merton. And you posted this quote from Merton that that struck you you said it floored you and i'm going to read it and i, I want, yeah, yeah. To, want to, to hear your response so thomas merton wrote i face the fact that oh and i should tell everyone merton wrote this in 1967 i face the fact that i am living in an immoral blind even in some sense criminal society which is hypocritical bloated self-righteous and unable to see its true condition. By and large, the people are nice as long as they are not disturbed in their comfortable and complacent lives. They cannot see the price of their respectability. And I am part of it. And I don't know what to do about it, apart from symbolic and feudal gestures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that, you know, for me, it's it's just like that, you know, thinking about James Baldwin earlier and, you know, the fact that we're talking about 60 years and so much of that still rings absolutely true. Um, I had a couple of friends who I love, uh, you know, one of them was was the woman that this book is dedicated to uh, who who responded to that on my you know, I'd quoted that on my personal page. And she had responded to it. And I think that some people had some people, I think, misread what he was saying as an excuse for uh, inaction, you know, as if, as if he were saying uh, like it's futile uh, to. And I don't know that, I, 
you know, you obviously know his work much better than I do. I don't, I didn't get that sense at all. What I did get was the sense that you keep doing the work and you keep doing the work and so little changes uh, and so little changes because, you know, the, the rest of white America is unwilling to do it, uh, to do the work uh, and that it can, there comes a moment where you just start looking around thinking, what do I do? Uh, you know, uh, what, what can you do? Um, and, and what I loved was your response, uh, you know, to that quote, which your response was that you continue to call it out. Right. Um, you know, that's part of the work. Um, you know, I think that I'll read this part. Do you mean about if we don't become the truth tellers? Correct. If we don't become the truth tellers, then a different kind of erosion can happen in which resentment breeds, a resentment that would threaten the wholeness of my heart, this is me writing, of my heart and soul. If nothing else, I must be whole and respond to racism in a way that is true to the depths of my being. What does that look like? Yeah, yeah. And so and so for me, it's that, um, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this back just a little ways and say that like I say very proudly that I'm a 12th generation North Carolinian. Well, you can't say that you're a 12th generation white anything in this country without almost assuredly acknowledging that that means that you come from enslavers. Uh, And in my case, it most certainly does. Uh, I come from people who had others enslaved. Uh, I come from people who fought to preserve the institution of slavery. Um, And I think that is a hard thing for people to to cough up and lay on the table. Uh, And I think part of the reason is that they feel shame uh, and they feel guilt. And for me, I feel neither. Uh, I'm not ashamed of that past. Uh, I don't feel guilty for that past. Um, What I would feel ashamed of is to recognize that I continue to be a direct beneficiary of those systems and then refuse to fucking say it, right? Yeah. Like yeah. That, is sh- that is shameful. Yeah. Uh, if, if I lived that way, I would feel guilty about that, about knowing that I reap the benefits of that and refusing to acknowledge it and refusing to change it. And that's why it struck me so much that... You, that word truth teller, uh, just, just that, uh, it's, it's admitting it, uh, it's talking about it. And I think a lot of people continue to think that the work is, uh, is like, and this is, I've just come off the road from like a month and a half of events. And so you hear all of these things that people are thinking and saying, and I think so many people kept thinking that the work had to be like, this big thing, like, uh, you know, it had to be a march or it had to be, you know, going in a a demonstration. And it's like, no, uh, the real work, I think, for the majority of white America is needs to take place at the kitchen table. Right. Like it needs to take place with our own families. It needs to take place with our friends. Uh, You know, those are the people we need to be having these conversations uh, with, um, you know, and, and so for me, uh, you know, all of those things I think are linked and that's just, I love that idea of, of, you know, of what you're, you know, what you said is that that's the work, right? You continue to call it out. Uh, I think, I think the other part that he had said was something about, uh, uh, the man in the prince's clothes, uh, yeah, the emperor's new clothes that the child yeah. keeps saying that the emperor is naked at all costs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, th- and that's right. That's what we have to keep doing is saying that the emperor is naked. The emperor is naked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You and I are both writers. And and I think that the thing that I was trying to, to come to terms with is that is is that exactly what you said, that it doesn't have to be the the big march and i don't have to necessarily be out somewhere with a sign that the thing that that i do and the thing that i can do best and most coherently is is right right and and hope that 
that that we are spurring exactly what you're talking about because I feel the same way that that change has to happen from within and it has to happen with with one person speaking to another um, within friends within families and and to to look at what what they really think about things and how they feel but not be made to feel as you said ashamed about their their background right or ashamed yeah. of where they come yeah. from you said you cannot change that it is no. it is a fact right it is yeah. absolutely a fact but to to really think about what what does privilege mean and and you know does one deny um, their position in society and, and and how it has come their way yeah. now now david um the other interesting thing though the other complex thing that you tackle in this book is that we tend to think um about white privilege in terms of class, right? And you have characters in this book who say, well, you know, I I've, I've barely have two coins rubbed together. I live here in this trailer, right? And so, you know, what yeah. kind of privilege is, you know, what has come my way in terms of white privilege, right? Yeah. And, and yet you you lay that out as well to say, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think that what inevitably happens when we try to have these conversations, is that we we tend to hit um, there are two big roadblocks that happen over and over and over, and one is uh, is is this uh, conflation of race and and class, uh, and it's this idea of privilege. Uh, and so you know I think about someone like my father, uh, who grew up very hard. Uh, you know, and one of his earliest memories was growing up in a house uh, that he he just remembered calling it the rat house where he was afraid to go to sleep because he was afraid rats would chew his feet off of his legs. Uh, and he was three or four years old. And it's very hard to take someone who knew poverty with that type of intimacy and to, and to then say that yours was a life of privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's immediately taken back by uh, by the the phrasing more than anything, uh, you know. And what it is is it's a failure to recognize. It, no one is saying that that your life was easy. You know what they're saying is that your life was not made more difficult by the color of your skin. Um, you know he's less likely to be pulled over by police. Uh, he's less likely to have his car searched once pulled over. Uh, you know, he's most assuredly always made more at every job he's ever had uh, than, than his his black counterparts uh, who were working the same job. Uh, you know, this country right now we're working at a we're working at a wage gap uh, that's bigger than it has been since you know the seventies. Uh, you know, between black and white workers, which is to you know. So part of it is this, in some ways, uh, me and a buddy were talking about this once and we were talking about how the left, the left has a PR problem. Like we tend to, <laughs> and I say that as, as part of the left, uh, you know, but uh, we have a PR problem where we tend to phrase things very poorly. Uh, and so just the idea of privilege, like it, it, it gets, it, it muddies the water. And it gets us away from what we're trying to talk about. Um, and so I think that I think that's always one of the one of the major roadblocks when we start trying to have that conversation is is uh, is distinguishing uh, between race and class. And the, the way I think about it is that, uh, you know, if we think about race and class as a Venn diagram, you know, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, but make no mistake that one is on top of the other, right? Like they're not working side by side. Uh, there is still a hierarchy of power. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, I, I think that we're constantly trying to pick apart uh, that roadblock just so that we can start having the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, all of these complex layers of this conversation, I'm just, amazed by how you managed to to work it all into this book oh. um, now in order to tell this story though this is not and i'm telling the 
the readers here in, in, in the call who haven't read this book, this is not a book with only white characters, right? You have a Toya Gardner, you have her grandmother, Vess, and you have to tell their story and you have to write across race, which has you know gotten some writers into trouble for things like that. But, but I feel that one has to be able to tell stories like this, right? So you have to be able to yeah. build a character who is not you, right? Yeah. So, and and I will say that you've done it well. You've oh, done it really well. well. And I will, this part, I'm, I'm going to quote Toya's grandmother here that I thought was absolutely fascinating. She said, in the end, my happiness was my defiance. My joy was my act of dissent. And that's the, the difference between us, sweet girl, for the good and for the bad. That's what your mother never has been able to accept. And that's okay. She doesn't have to, and neither do you. Each one of us has to live our own truth. So even within that family, Vess, her daughter Dana, and Toya, you have this level of how each of them confronts racism and not always agreeing, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, very complex levels. And I'm fascinated that, that you could see it, you understood it to express it. Now, what I want to know, both as a writer and, and as a, a teacher of writing, is how you came to develop these characters. Now, my feeling is that it, it requires empathy, it requires compassion, and you have to ask a lot of questions. But empathy, and I'm going to quote one of your previous novels, um, The Line That Held Us, uh, you wrote, empathy's not standing over a hole looking down and saying you understand. Empathy is having been in that hole yourself. So yes. I wanna know what, what came into play for you as you were creating these characters and what questions did you ask? What research did you have to do? What of yourself came to bear as you wrote the, the, these people? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, th I think that that's a really big question. Um, you know, and I think that, I think that in order to create any type of meaningful art, uh, the artist has to work from a place of fearlessness and they have to work from a place of vulnerability. Uh, and, and so for me, I try to operate from that place. Um, but anytime you're writing across gap, uh, and this is, you know, this, we couldn't be talking to anybody who this is more true. Uh, any gap that I cross, I'm crossing from a place of power. Any gap I cross. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that is hard for a lot of people, uh, a lot of writers to understand is like, it's not just a matter of crossing the gap. And, and there, there are lots of gaps. The gap could be place. Uh, you could, you could write, uh, you know, about Appalachia and you're crossing that place. And I would say that you're coming, you, if you make that jump, you're operating from a place of power. Uh, so for me, place is power, gender is power, sexuality is power, uh, you know, uh, race is power. And so every gap that I jumped, I'm operating from a place of power. Uh, that does not mean that I cannot do it. What that does mean is that if I make mistakes, those mistakes are not inconsequential. Uh, that, that should the mistake be pointed out, that I can't get defensive and, oh, why did this? Or why did so-and-so get to do this? Why, you know, uh, I think about writers that I love, like like uh, Sean Cosby, S.A. Cosby. You know, and Sean, right, Sean's, uh, you know, black guy, grew up in Virginia, understands the South incredibly well, writes white characters. Uh, and it's, and so I, I can see people like, well, why does he get to do it? And, and, and I can't. What, well, there's lots of things happening. One is that him crossing that gap does not constitute power in the same way that me crossing that gap does. Uh, and so I think first and foremost, you have to recognize um, 
you know, you have to recognize the gap and you have to recognize whether or not crossing that gap constitutes operating from a place of power. Um, but I was, there's a writer that I love uh, named Alexander Chi. And, and one time, yeah, and one time he was, uh, he was talking about writing across gaps. Uh, but he was saying, you know, that he was talking about multiple questions you needed to ask yourself. And he said, the first is why, you know, why are you crossing the gap? Uh, you know, and, and he said, the second question is, uh, you know, how many people who are a part of this community that you're writing about, uh, do you even know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, and I've had, I've had people tell me or white writers ask me, well, can I write a black character? And they don't, they don't even, you know, they don't know any black folks at all. Uh, and that's problematic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but the third question was the question that he asked that I'd never heard. And, and the longer I've sat with it, the more brilliant I think it is, is he said, how many people from that community are on your bookshelf? And uh, so for me, when I think about the idea of empathy, uh, I cannot stand in that hole, literally. I cannot walk out this door and ever know, I can never know that with any sort of real intimacy uh but i think about what george saunders said and he said that fiction when it's done well has the capacity to serve as empathy's training wheels mm -hmm. uh you know and then i think about sitting with randall keenan i think about sitting with ernest Gaines. i think about sitting with crystal wilkinson i think about sitting with natalie basil or lisa cross smith or all of these black writers who i love right mm -hmm. uh and that's my entrance, uh, like studying it, uh, you know, studying all of these things, because all of a sudden I'm allowed to walk in somebody else's shoes for 300 pages. Uh, and you do that again and again and again. And I think when fiction is done well, it does exactly that. Uh, you know, I think about a writer I love like Chigozi Obiama. Uh, a Nigerian writer, uh, he wrote a novel called The Fisherman, and I fell in love with it. And uh, I don't know anything about, I, I don't even know if I've ever met a, someone from Nigeria. Uh, I didn't need to, right? Uh, like, like you know, it, it's, it's uh, so yeah, I think that question that he asked at the end, I think that's a brilliant question question and i think that you know anytime you're wanting to write across that gap um yeah. that's some very uh you know that's work that you can sink your teeth into yeah uh, you know like i know for a fact if you if you did want to write a book about appalachia uh you would read the work that's coming out of this place uh you know you would read the writers who who were doing the work uh, and if you sat with it long enough, you would you would walk away with an understanding of this place. And that understanding would be something that would illuminate the work you did. Uh, you know, it, and so I think it's just a matter of doing the work. And I think, sadly, time and time again, people don't want to do it. Uh, you know, the people who complain about things like not being able to tell this story or having to work with an authenticity read uh, or this or that. Uh, those are people who don't want to be held accountable when they make mistakes. And that's problematic. Uh, yeah. You know, this whole idea of cancel culture in my mind is bullshit. It, it, nobody's can't, you can do anything you want. It's just that now you're being held accountable. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, that reminds me of something. Um, and I think it was mentioned in um, the second essay I sent you a conversation I had with an entrepreneur who his mastermind group had wanted to sell these um, um, that this product that showed that they were in alliance with people of color. And, and they thought, and he, he was asking me about it. And I did not know this guy before someone had introduced him to me. He's like, well, you know, have ask her if this would be, you know, a good product. And he said that, that the people in the mastermind group you know, knew that they didn't have people of color in the group, but they wanted to do something, right? They wanted to do something. So they came up with this product that they thought was really cool. And I said to him, you know, and, you know, I've been an entrepreneur. I know what a mastermind group is. 
I know what a networking group is. I said, usually you invite people that you know, right? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then it sounds like you guys don't have people in that group because you don't know any people of color. And he's yeah. like, well, yeah, I suppose that's right. And I was like, well, that that sounds to me like the place to start instead of, yeah. right? Instead of creating a product and, and trying to exert some sort of influence from the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I think, you know, and, and just the ability to recognize that, um, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, I was very fortunate to work with, uh, I've ne I don't know who she is. I know that it was, I know that it's a woman. I don't know her name. Uh, I've never met her. I've never spoken to her. I know that she has to be one of the most brilliant academics uh, that I've ever interacted with because of the feedback she gave me. Um, but I was very fortunate, you know, I wanted an authenticity reader, uh, and I was very fortunate that my publisher, uh, worked to provide that. Um, uh, and I got that feedback and, and I'll never forget my, my editor said, she said, none of, she said, nobody here at Putnam has ever seen anything like this. Uh, she said, typically the feedback is about two and a half, three pages, Mine was 25 single space with 10 pages of footnotes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything that was brought up uh, was being played. It was being placed in a, in a very long context of scholarship uh, and, and of work. And, and that's not to say that everything that was being brought up were things that I had to change, but I can assure you that it was things I would have been very wise to consider. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had to sit with all of it. Uh, and, and when I think about people who don't, who wouldn't want that, uh, that's dumbfounding to me. Um, you know, and I, I can think of so many things that, and it, it, it's the minutia, right? Like it's, it's the little tiny things. Like it, it wasn't even something big, but it was, a, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, there's a scene where Toya goes to the, to the, um, you know, to the protests that are happening at, at the Confederate statue. And she's the only black person there. Mm -hmm. And the woman said she would not have been there. And, I don't know whether or not she would, she would or she wouldn't, but what she forced me to recognize was the hyper awareness that Toya would have had in that situation. Yeah. And that's something I had not fully considered. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, because I, because I've never had to, yeah. you know, and I never will have to. Yeah. Uh, and it was like she would not have walked into that situation without fully recognizing that she was the only one who was ever in any sort of real danger. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, that's the type of thing that like, you know, you go back and you work it in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you work in a conversation between Toy and her grandmother sitting there and her grandmother wondering, you know, is she stupid? You know, I mean, her great vest doesn't say that, but Vess is wondering, she's wondering to have, we not taught her yeah. the danger that she's in, Yeah. you know, and suddenly you work these things in, uh, and that's work that I couldn't have done on my own. Uh, you know, it's a powerful, it's a powerful piece. Uh, it's a, it, so much of the novel turns on that. Right. And, and her, her friend from the school wanting her to go and, and, and that conflict about whether or not she should. And, and you're right, you know, someone from the outside would think, well, of course she would go, you know, this is because of her, but it's not the same. No, no. Yeah. Uh, and this, this was a kind of uh, what was odd and looking back, it was a very difficult time to try to write is that, uh, you know, I had written the majority of this novel up until about 2019. Uh, the novel set in 2019. Uh, most of the work I, I was doing in, in 2018. And then in 2020, when, you know, everything, you know, the, 
I think we reached a fracture point as a country, you know, when, when we experienced all of those things just back to back to back to back. And all of a sudden, um, you know, it was something that was happening all over the country. And, and there were protests around that statue in, in downtown Silva. Uh, and people here thought that the book was written in response to that. And the truth is that it was, it was uh, the opposite. And it became very hard to write it because I, I couldn't navigate that space between the real world outside my door and the world that I had created. Um, but when we watched those, those two protests, or watched those protests happening, the majority of the people who were standing down there were white people. Uh, and it's not that there isn't, uh, you know, in some ways a fairly substantial black community here, because there is, uh, you know, that I think, I think they weren't there for a reason right? Uh, they weren't there for the same reason that we're talking about. Uh, so, so it was really, you know, I think it's just trying to navigate that space, I think is, uh, you know, and, and just think about, think about those things. Um, you know, there were so many things that, that she brought up that, that I hadn't thought about. Um, and there were things that, you know, I've had, uh, you know, a very good friend of mine that the, that the book is dedicated to Marie Cochran, who's, who's, you know, a, a black visual artist uh, that I love. And she and I were having a conversation and it was about something that I had changed that Marie and Marie questioned it. And I said, well, it was this way. And I said, I changed it. And this is why and Marie was like, no, she, and she was like, your instincts were right to begin with. And what it had to do with uh, looking back, I think, was the rural experience versus, uh, you know, she, I don't think that the woman that I was working with had ever lived in a place like this. Uh, that quote that you said from Vess earlier, that idea of, of you know, uh, my happiness is my descent. Um, I think that's something that we see play out in rural communities and and from the outside, it can seem uh, like passivity, uh, but it's not. Uh, it, it is, it's something that's very deeply rooted. In, you know, if, if they're not, the people that I'm referring to are never going to be stepped on. No one is going to step on them. Um, but that, that passivity and that, and that just keeping blind was a survival thing. And, 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 uh, you know, I just look at the way so many people here operate and it's like they don't want to be uh, they don't want to draw attention. Uh, they don't want to go stand there. And it's because I'm happy right here where I am. You know, it's leave me the fuck alone. Uh, and and so I think Vess for me was that, uh, you know, she, she embodied so much of that, that, you know, that rural experience uh you know i sat in that church that's that that this some of this novel is based at and there was a woman there who who grew up here you know and she talked very mountain and she left here and she moved to atlanta and she said she was on a radio show once uh and the the guy on the radio sh show basically told her he wasn't going to listen to her and she was like well what are you talking about and he was like well i know you're not black and she and sh she was you know but she talked very mountain and it was that he couldn't uh, he couldn't imagine somebody talking like that. And I think that um, what I'm getting at is that I think that we have a bad habit of trying to uh, like make the black experience look a very certain way. Uh, and the truth is that I think that there's a whole lot of complexity that exists, uh, you know, and most assuredly, you know, with with the black rural experience. Uh, that's that's why I love like Natalie Basil that that wrote Queen Sugar. Uh, she put together a gorgeous collection called We Are Each Other's Harvest uh, that I think is one of the most beautiful books of the past, you know, 20 years. Um, but that's some of the work that she's doing is for so long, uh, you know, 
black and rurality were things that that were like opposed you know uh it was like these things don't exist and it's like well of course it, of course it exists uh you know of course it exists um and so yeah i think it's just trying to think about things with with a little bit more uh complexity maybe so omar is back which means that we have to take questions but but two things i want to say really quickly number one you and i have to keep talking because <laughs> You know, my father was from Mississippi and fish with bamboo poles, and we have to talk about all that and fishing. But also, um, I don't know if Marie has read this book yet, but I just also wanted to to appreciate the fact that it wasn't put on her to to sort of you know authenticate your, this book that that you did the research. You, your publisher had the authenticity reader, and that somebody else did that, right? Yeah, that wasn't put on her alone and and that it was paid uh, yeah. you know i mean i mean uh you know I, you do the work and, and you hope for the best and that and that's not to say that you know I, I think right now most of the reactions uh have been good but that's not to say they always will be um you know i mean somebody tomorrow could send me an email and, and i can assure you that i will sit with it uh, if, if some, if, if I failed somewhere and if it's pointed out and I'm sure I did, uh, I'm absolutely sure that there are places I've failed. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That time and time again is, is, well, what do you think of it? You know, uh, it's where we place the work and we continue to place the work squarely, uh, on the backs of, of people of color. And we tend to not even want to pay them for that work. Uh, the first question here, and Omar, if it's okay, I see the time is getting short. I'm just going to go in. Uh, <clears throat> someone asked, how is your book being received? Is it landing the way you hoped it would? Do you feel readers are responding by opening the conversation? Yeah, I, th I, think, the, I think my response from readers has been great. Uh, I think that critical reception was silence. Uh, and when I look back, I think in some ways, and I may be completely wrong about this, but I feel like there, there, uh, I feel like it was uh, a risky thing for white critics to engage with. Uh, I don't know that they wanted to have the conversation that I was having, um, you know, but from readers, I think, you know, uh, it's probably been the best response to anything I've ever written. And at the end of the day, the only people I cared about were the people in that church uh, who I had sat with and who I had listened to uh, and whether or not the work I did uh, felt exploitative. And, uh, you know, so far that reception has been good and they've been proud of the work that I did. Um, and again, that's not to say that that will hold. Um, you know, I, th I think that you cannot cross the types of gaps that I crossed with this novel and not have stumbled. Um, I can personally think of places where I think I stumbled. Uh, but but when those missteps are pointed out, uh, I think the the wise thing to do is, is to not, uh, you know, get defensive, but to rather uh, look at it as a as a place to to shut your mouth and listen and continue with discourse. Yeah, like, um, and, and even just to, to sit with how you feel about it, right? Um, I love that scene where the sheriff is, you know, he's all upset and his wife is asking him, okay, so why? Yeah. Why are you upset about this conversation? Like, what is it? And and he could not put his, his finger on it and it roiled and roiled and roiled in him. Yeah, yeah. So another question, has there, has there been any blowback from your family and or white friends? Uh, no, um, but I can think of, you know, to get back to that idea of the real work being done at the kitchen table, uh, I can think of a conversation that I wound up having with my mother uh, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, and my mother's a very reflective person. She's, a, you know, a very strongly opinionated woman, but, but very reflective. 
uh, she sits with things. And I was describing an interaction that had happened at an event. Uh, and, and when I described it, uh, you know, we, we started having, I, I think a really difficult, you know, conversation and, uh, I'm thankful for it. Like I'm thankful for it. Uh, you know, I'm thankful for, uh, a lot of the conversations that have that have taken place uh because of it and and it, and that's again um uh, you know that's not to say that it's always going to be like that uh this book is 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 not an easy book uh there's nothing easy about it um and i think you know you just again you just do the work and and you hope for the best. Well, it's, you know, I'm going to read, this isn't a question, but it's in the chat. You know, um, one of, um, this is someone who had just asked a question. Um, when we started, you know, um, this person said, my skull is already exploding. I don't think I've ever heard a white male author go there, right? Yeah. And it's going to go buy this book right away. Oh, right. oh well, I hope it holds up. Uh, yeah, I think... I think at the end of the day, like I just keep looking at, uh, like I look at the ways that we try to work on issues in this country. And all I know is that what we've done is not working. Right. Like continuing to, to just, you know, usher the monster back into the closet and pray for, for, you know, six months, of downtime between one event and the next, that's not serving us very well. Uh, I think what would serve us well is to start to lay the ugly out on the table. Uh, and that's what I mean by making a statement like I am the descendant of enslavers. That is not an easy thing to say. Uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to say. It's not an easy thing to recognize. Uh, but until I lay that out on the table, uh, it's not doing me any good to carry it in my pocket. You know, when it's out there, we can start to have a conversation about what that looks like. Uh, what does that mean for this place? What does that mean for this country? What does that mean for all of the privileges that I still have? I, th I think we've reached a point where we're just going to flat out start having to have the hard conversations if we hope to, to get anywhere. Uh, and, and, the truth is that the majority of that is our work. Uh, and I mean the work of white folks. Um, you know, in some ways, this feels like remedial work, uh, which is to say that we're still having to go back and, and even acknowledge that these things exist, right? Uh, but you can't expect Nicole Hannah Jones or Ibram X. Kendi or Cornell West or, you know, um, Ishmael Reed or any other like brilliant black thinker to go back and explain this to you. Right. Like if you don't like they've got they've got bigger work they need to be doing. Uh, so so if there is the task of still going back and just solidifying the very fact that this is the system we are operating from. If that's the work I have to do, then I'll do it. Uh, you know, because, because the work that these other people are doing is, is, uh, it's too important for them to have to stop what they're doing to try to even get you up to a level playing field. So I'm, I know we only have a minute left, but I'm really tempted to ask this question, David, um, because this is something that I know, and I've written about this, um, an experience I had in high school where I realized that that I thought in a prejudiced way against um, a white boy that I had met because, you know, I just assumed that, that he would look down on me and all of these other things. Um, have you been assumed to be someone not of the left because of the way you sound and because of the way you look. Oh yeah. Yeah. How have yeah. you handled those situations? Uh, 
I think the minute I start talking uh, and people realize uh, I'm, I'm more well-read than they are, I'm more articulate than they are, uh like like i look like a, i mean i look like an idiot <laughs> you know i'm just this big goofy white guy in a camouflage hat uh with big giant boots uh usually i'm i'm riding around in an old pickup truck i like fishing i like hunting like you equate all of these things with with something that i'm not and so uh and in a lot of ways i think i think it helps me uh but and the reason that i i think that is is in some ways i think it takes people by surprise and the minute it comes from somebody who looks like me i think they listen in a different way um you know i think about uh i don't know i mean you you just look at the way uh like the people that that need to be reached are not listening to Nicole Hannah Jones, right? Like they're not. And it's because it's because they cannot acknowledge the racism and the misogyny and the fear uh, that, it, that is involved in seeing someone that strong and that articulate and that smart tell them about the world. Uh, it, it, they, they can't jump that gap. I'm a lot smaller gap for them to jump. Uh, and, and so I think in some ways you could say the very same things and it would be digestible in a way that it's not otherwise. Uh, it's, it's like the Trojan horse. Yeah. <laughs> I've snuck into the fucking castle. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, but in some ways I do. I, I think it's easier. Uh, you know, because they just don't expect it. Okay. Well, I think that's a great place to end this, even though we could <laughs> thank you so much for this conversation. Omar, I'll hand it back over to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was that was amazing amazing. Thank you so much, David and Safrania. Um, we hope to have you back in some way. That'd be really yeah. awesome to have this conversation keep going. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, you can buy uh, David's book, uh, preferably through us, but please just buy it. Um, and um, and thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you.